All right, folks, I'm your host, Vincent Green, and he's your host, Noah John Tui. We got Cara Mack in the back, and this is MDK Presents, Stephen J. Rubin. Hi, Stephen, and can you please tell the folks who you are and what you do? Oh, sure. Uh, uh, thank you, everybody. I am the author of the James Bond Movie Encyclopedia, 4th Edition, which uh, is now available for sale across all uh, platforms, including Amazon. I'm a writer, producer in Hollywood, former film publicist, documentarian, film historian, and all around movie lover. That's awesome. And so, Stephen, what are you here to is today? Did you see the new Bond movie? I saw it yesterday. And uh, I haven't seen it yet. So, without spiders, what was your initial reaction? Were you happy about the whole product? I, 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 I sent out a, a, a Facebook post last night. I said that if you watch. This movie on a small screen, you're missing out because this is big screen, big ass entertainment. I'll tell you, uh, well worth the wait. There's some startling surprises in the movie. I'm not going to spoil them here, but it's uh, it's why we go to the movie theaters. It really is. Bond is always spelled big, big entertainment. You know, the type of thing that's an event. And yeah. this is probably yeah. the biggest Bond event since Daniel Craig came on board in 2006. Oh, really? Yeah, because like uh, this one's the longest too, isn't it? It's like it's two two hours forty five minutes long. Unbelievably long. It, I think <laughs> it out, uh, Honor Majesty Secret Service was the previous record at two twenty. So I think this is uh, this is a long this is a long movie. But I didn't feel it was long. That I, was going to be my that. question. Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, sometimes you feel like you're in a movie theater forever. I'm glad I never saw what was it the Scorsese movie about the Irishman. Uh, no, no, not that one. The the one where uh, uh, Japan silence. No, the one in, in New York in the 1880s. Uh, uh, the uh, one where he's uh, talking about uh, the gangs of New York. Once upon a time in uh, in America. That no, one. no, the gangs of New York. Oh, gangs of New York. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's one who's talking about the gangs of New York. God, yeah. it's on the tip of my tongue. <laughs> Sorry about that. that, that <laughs> I, I need more information, Stephen. <laughs> exactly. that, the movie, that movie was so long. It took me four nights to see it on a screener at home. It was just, it took forever. But Bond is nothing like that. Bond moves at a uh, pace. I, I read some of the reviews already. And uh, it's a very intelligent movie. It may be too intelligent for me, <laughs> but I, I, I deciphered most of it. Uh, it's, it's a little, little complicated plot, but... The performances are great. And Craig, I'll tell you guys right now, I would put a vote in for him for best actor this year. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. wow. That's a big statement, especially for an action movie. It's a big statement for yeah. an action movie. It's not unheard yes. of, but it's yeah. a big statement. It's a big statement, but I'll tell you, I think that he he really pulled out all the stops, and uh, I, I really applaud his performance, as I do about everybody's performance. It was a good, great across-the-board thing. I am... Um... In preparation for this podcast, I, I went back and I watched the, the last eight Bond movies. Um, the the four from uh, Pierce Brosnan and Daniel Craig's previous four before uh, No Time to Die. And um, I noticed even throughout the Pierce Brosnan run that you could actually see this kind of change in the extent is a little bit more gritty. And like, you know, even like I think it's, um, is it Tomorrow Never Dies or is it uh, the one after where he gets kidnapped by North Koreans? Um, that's in Die Another Day. Or Die Another Day, sorry, yeah. Uh, that was the last one he did, wasn't it? Correct, correct. You know, I think that um, Pierce Brosnan's movies were st still had a little touch of the Roger Moore era, a little yeah. bit more fun. Mm, and mm. Uh, I think Cheesy that start and stuff. Yeah, starting in the early 2000s with all the competition from the Bourne films, Mission Impossible... Mm. These are film series that push the Bond movies to get grittier. I also think the world has changed considerably yeah. in the last 15 years. It's become much darker. Most of, the, most of the cinema that comes out is pretty dark and pretty not very optimistic. And uh, I think Bond being on the front lines of fighting international terrorism or whatever has to keep up with that so what 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 happens daniel craig comes on the scene in 2006 and he's he's the gritty thuggish bond we need yeah he wasn't as gadgety or 
You know what I mean? A lot of times he was just he rolled up his sleeves and actually did dirty work with his hands. Even, I found that very refreshing in Casino Royale. Was it in the start of uh, Spectre or was it Skyfall? I just watched so many of them so close together. But when Ben Winshaw meets him in um, a museum and he just hands him a side piece and a radio transmitter. And he's like, what did you expect, Mr. Bond? An exploding pen? I'm sorry, we don't do that. <laughs> we don't do that thing anymore, that kind of thing anymore. You know, and that's where you can see it nearly making like a, a kind of mocking, like a little tongue in cheek at its past. That what we used to do is outdated, and that's what kind of like the running theme, isn't it, with the Danny Craig movies? Is that you're a product of the past, your ways are outdated, and like and throughout the movies, you can kind of see this slow advance, or even not slow, but quick advancement of technology, how warfare is conducted, how espionage is conducted, and they're saying like it's constantly the running theme is. The boots on the ground, the human element is becoming like um, antiquated. Well, you know, it's interesting that uh, there was so much uh, kind of pushback when Pierce Brosnan's last film introduced the invisible car. That was quite silly. <laughs> it was pageantry, I, think, I thought. Fast and yeah. Furious Bond, that's what that, that movie was. Yeah, I think that uh, ever since then, I, I could arguably say that everything in the in the Daniel Craig's movies was pretty believable. It could happen. Yes. Yeah. There he actually seemed like an extremely well-trained agent to me. Right. As opposed to just judo chops to the neck like Roger Moore. <laughs> <laughs> but nobody judo chopped like Roger Moore. No, he's just no. so good at it. Fighting and he jaws on a train else. and he's just like... Up <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. A lot of people disparage Roger as being that funny Bond and that the movies don't play as well anymore. I have to say this. I'm always uh, trying to say that Roger Moore catapulted the Bond series in the 70s to a new level with a new generation. Those movies became more and more spectacular. And at a time when tentpole, you know, major studio Star Wars type movies were just beginning to be released, Bond led the way and Roger was the guy. I mean, those movies were event movies back in the 70s, particularly the 77 release, The Spy Who Loved Me with Barbara Bach. And though they became increasingly more spectacular they got a little crazy with moonraker and the space shuttle and a view to a kill but i think that when we talk about the history of bond you can't dismiss the impact roger moore had in broadening the scope of the series so you think he made it nearly more mainstream that mainstream appeal or give it the next generation their bond the next generation young people you know kids who were 8 10 12 in 73, 74, 77, these were kids who had not seen the Connery movies and they they became, they became fell in love with Roger and I think they propelled the series. Also, they catered to a real youth audience with characters like Jaws, who obviously was a l- way out of the typical, uh, you know, realistic spectrum. It was an odd job. Was odd was job was the half, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Oddjob. <laughs> Can I, I'm going to ask you this. Just, I, I thought... We'd like to have a conversational tone, but when I was I was sitting with some friends last night and I told them I was going to be speaking to you and a friend of mine's eyes lit up and he just said, if I was, what's, Steve, what's his name? I said, Steve Rubin. He said, if I had that guy, I, I, I'd probably drive him crazy because I have 50 questions I've always wanted to know. But I'm going to ask one. I want an unpopular opinion that you hold about James Bond. The way, like there's some sacred opinions. Everyone loves Connery. Everyone hated George Lazenby's out. And there's a couple of things that are generally agreed on. But is there anything that you fell away from the mainstream ideas of Bond on? A film you liked, maybe a, a, a guilty pleasure or anything along those lines? Oh, sure, sure. Well, it's funny. Uh, getting back to Roger, uh, my favorite Roger Moore film is Octopussy, which uh, is it can be very funny at times, especially when they're in India. And the concept of James Bond disarming an A-bomb on a U.S. nuclear base <laughs> while wearing a clown suit was yeah. so, so ridiculous. In, it was quite meta. It was... I mean, it's so ridiculous in conception, but in actual execution, that's one of my favorite scenes in the whole series. I mean, he's in a, he's in a clown suit and he's got to convince the, the, the commander of a U.S. Air Force base that there's an A-bomb in the cannon. And look at him, look at him like he's nuts. And Roger, to his credit, he really pulled off that scene. And I thought that uh, there are some really big moments in Octopussy. And it's interesting, having just seen No Time to Die, one of the things I always really wanted to see were the big set pieces, the large action pieces 
on a big canvas. And I think that's why I like the new movie a lot, that we go back to some really big, big filmmaking. I mean, this is this is a movie that I think was partially shot with IMAX cameras. So you're going to have a lot of a lot of uh, really cool scenery that you won't enjoy on a small screen. So if anything compels people to go back to the cinemas, it's going to be Bond. But Octopussy for me is a guilty pleasure. A lot of people just hate that movie. Moonraker for me. Great. Moonraker was a was a, again. I I I'm not quite quite as old as the the seventies. Roger Timothy Dalton was probably Bond in kind of my formative years. But um, I remember Moonraker was just on television maybe two or three times a year. And it was something I watched with my family. Mm -hmm. And as a kid, I just thought it was excellent action. And then as I got older, I could realize there's a little bit of silliness to it. But I loved it. I don't know how to, I just loved it. It was a film that meant something to me. I had sentimental attachment to it. So even kids right now might look back on it as being silly, but that's the way films were. Uh, it's a film of its era, unapologetically oh, so. Yeah. Oh yeah, um, also you, you really embrace what you first see as Bond. Yes. You know, it's now been uh, 57 years since I saw Goldfinger in the cinema, and it's still my favorite Bond movie. And I, although Casino Royale is right up there with it, uh, Sean and uh, Goldfinger are still my favorites, um, and that will never change. You generally embrace the Bond you grow up with. So if you grew up with Roger, he's your favorite Bond. If you grow up with Pierce, it's he's your favorite Bond. Yeah, I grew up with Pierce, and he's Irish too, so... Didn't hurt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, because like when I watched back the Pierce Brosnan movies, uh, the other day, I just chuckled a lot because it was really nostalgic for me. I was like, I remember these being huge blockbuster fairs when they came out when I was a kid. I remember looking forward to it. It was like, an Irish guy's playing James Bond. Like, this is amazing. And then he was like, one of the most successful <laughs> Bonds there. And you're like, you're watching that and you're just like, this is incredible. And even when I watched it back the other day, the special effects that haven't aged well or whatever, but I still laughed and I chuckled. And all the set pieces were incredible. Like the opening to GoldenEye where he like comes off the dam, he goes into the base, like kills a lot of people and then he has to escape. And like in the, the first like five or 10 minutes is like this one big, long, massive opening. And it's just like, oh, inspiring. You know, it's like, that's what block, blockbuster movie making should be. You know, it's like, the, it's like, that's what Bond movies do. The first five or 10 minutes, the intro is amazing. Like if you fall back to like um, Quantum of Solace, is it where he chases the guy uh, in Africa? Um, like for like five or ten minutes as well, and it's just like he's doing like parkour upside. Like no, that was the, first, oh, no, that's, the opening to Casino Royale. That's quite, uh, it's, 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 it's Casino Royale. Royale. Sorry, oh, I watched. Yeah. I've watched them all so close together over the past few days. It's like all one big thing. Yeah. <laughs> he remembers Roger Moore fighting Daniel Craig on a train. You know, it's all just. <laughs> yeah, together, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Mar Martin Scorsese got into a little trouble last year when he said that all those Marvel Universe movies weren't really movies. They're they're Boo, amusement Martin park rides. <laughs> and I would say that the cool thing about Bond is, yes, they, they are like an amusement park ride, <clears throat> but they're also packed with great stories and yes. really and they're not that re repetitive. I, I is, With all due respect to Marvel Universe, I think, you know, how many Iron Man movies do we need? How many, you know, how many Spider-Man yes. movies do we need? I kind of feel like I've seen that movie. I love the characters, but with Bond, you're always feeling like you're going to get something a little bit different. I agree. And with you uh, I think that um, people ask me a lot, isn't this going to be the last Bond movie? And I say, forget it. You know, this the Bond movies have never cut their nose off to spite their face. They, no. they always uh, are about a human being, not a superhero with a cape fighting the good fight. And I think we'll always have James Bond movies. Um, you know, would not surprise me. I'll be long gone. A hundred years from now, if they're still making Bond movies, yeah. Actually, one thing I wanted to ask you about the continuity of the Bond franchise is: Do you know um, uh, Q, uh, who carried over throughout most of the movies until he was uh, or something, uh, until he was uh, replaced during the uh, Pierce Brosnan era by John Cleese? I can't remember the actor's name, but like, and Judy Dench, who played M in the Pierce Brosnan era, she carried over for some of the Daniel Craig era. And I want to know is. Is James Bond everyone and no one? Is he not a person? Is he just a moniker? That's and what is, moniker and, is the word. And is everybody James Bond? Like like Sean Connery is I'm it's Bond and James Bond. He's just James Bond until he's not James Bond anymore. You know, that kind of thing. And like Danny Craig is James Bond until he's not James Bond. And Pierce Brosnan is James Bond. It's just a designation. Like 007, his name is James Bond. Maybe 009 has a different moniker. 008 has a different moniker. 
So if like for if I'm 006, I'm Vincent Green, but when I retire, Noel's 006, now he's Vincent Green. You know, that's the way I feel like if you look at the continuity, the actors, the way they carry them over, the James Bond is no one. He's just a moniker, you know? Well, it's, it is interesting. I think that um, in the history of literature, cinema, whatever, we have these archetype characters. We got Robin Hood, we've got Tarzan, we've got Superman, and the, many people have played those characters. I think that James Bond is a human being. Uh, the 007 designation is not, you know, uh, the person. It's just simply a designation. And you'll discover in the new movie, I'm not giving anything really away, yeah. James Bond has <clears throat> retired. He's no longer in the Secret Service. They've well, given 007 to a uh, designation to a... a, 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 a LaShawna Lynch. Is it, LaShawna uh, Lynch, who's, yeah, by the way, yeah. terrific. Um, I think that... Um, I, I think that the filmmakers want to continue the, the franchise as long as they can. So the franchise is bigger than any other actor. It is a great credit to the series that they were able to go from a Sean Connery uh, to a Roger Moore. Obviously, they did the George Lazenby film on Her Majesty's Secret Service, who, by the way, I thought was terrific. When you know the history of George Lazenby, he had no acting experience. His one claim to fame was on a TV commercial in Britain carrying a chocolate bar on stage. That was his whole acting experience. How did he, he land the role? Hmm. He lied his way through all these auditions. He told people <laughs> he made. Until you make of, it. He, he, told, he told people he made a bunch of films in Eastern Europe, and this was before <laughs> the internet. You could Brilliant. never check these facts. And Peter Hunt, the director, Peter had edited the first five Bond movies. They finally gave him the director job on On Your Majesty's Secret Service. When he found out that uh, George had no acting experience. He nearly had a heart attack. I mean, here he's getting his opportunity to direct Bond, and Bond is a total neophyte. So if you look at that movie and see the performance they got out of Lazenby, pretty impressive. What? What? How would you expect? Because Lazenby is considered the man who almost killed Bond. How would you define? Like, how would you? Def what was wrong with that film that people went after it so hard when they when it came out? And it was, and he was a one, a one and done Bond, the single and only, the only one, one and done yeah. Bond. Well, I think that he was not Sean Connery, so there was a pushback on him. That's hard. But, I, yeah. I, I, but the story of Lazenby is interesting because Peter knew he had no acting experience. Peter decided to stay away from him and keep him a little bit off balance through the performance. So um, George did not have a pleasant time making that film for the most part. He was left alone a lot. And then he got the world's worst advice from his agent at that time. His agent literally told him, this is about 1969, that Bond was over. <laughs> get out of this. Don't come back. Get out of this. So George Lazenby, George Lazenby was basically advised to leave the series. A lot of people think he was fired. That's, was that's fired. an impression well, I would have had my entire life. Do you know? To be honest. No. Yeah. Do you think it might have helped Roger Moore uh, because Sean Connery was so loved in his portrayal of James Bond that George Lazenby actually did, he was like a buffer. So it, the comparison now is with Lazenby and not with Connery when you look at more, you know, in the per public's perception. Because he was an improvement from Lazenby and he was less compared to Connery because there was something there in the middle. You know what I mean? So Lazenby was obviously going to be directly compared to Connery because that's who uh, came before him. So now that Lazenby came before more, am I correct in the order? Yeah. So more now is going to be um, compared to Lazenby and not um, Connery. But do you think that might have helped him and why people might like him more than maybe his portrayal deserves or whatever? You know, I, I'm, Vincent, I'm not sure I know how to answer that question, but I will tell you that um, Roger Moore was more of a known presence by the time he does Bond in 73. He had been known as the saint on television he had done some other television series. Even in America, he did the Maverick series. Um, I think that in terms of carrying the banner for Bond, Roger was a much more appropriate choice. Now, I've just told you that I love George's performance, and I think he was a terrific Bond given his experience. I truly believe that if George had carried the band mantle, I don't think it, the Bond series would have survived uh, the level that the Roger Moore series went to. I think George was a very good Bond. 
And I would have liked to have seen him in more Bond films, but I don't think he would have carried the banner like Roger did. Ro the Divine well, ranking I, the Bonds for me, because we're speaking about how you feel about Bonds compared to other Bonds. Where, 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 what, what's, what's the, the Steve J. Rubens list of Bonds? Well, Connery, Connery's my number one and always will be. As I mentioned earlier, when you grow up with a Bond, he's your Bond. Yeah. Uh, Daniel Craig is right right near him, very close. I, I think that I've totally embraced Daniel Craig from the first moment I saw him on screen in, in Casino Royale. I would say that um, uh, Pierce Brosnan would probably be third for me. I would say... Um, Roger would be fourth, and well, uh, yeah, Lazenby's in there too. I think it's it, for me. It's Connery, Craig, Lazenby's appearance, then Brosnan, then Moore, and then I was not a Timothy Dalton fan, although he was a he was good. He just, for my money, did not have the what do you call it? Kind of the aura uh, that attracts both men and women. I thought he was good. But he just didn't have that panache. Mainstream that appeal. Mainstream appeal. I think Dalton went back earlier than Daniel Craig to a grittier approach. Uh, I just thought that, he, well, first of all, The Living Daylights was more designed as a Roger Moore film. So it, I don't know if it was originally written for Timothy. And then License to Kill was not one of my favorite Bond movies. I thought it was way too dark and I didn't like the plot. I mean, it was just, it played like a long Miami Vice episode. Sometimes, though, you can only work in the film you're in. So sometimes you look at someone and you think, think he just wasn't in a great Bond film. Because I know Daniel Craig did a great job, but he was he had the look of, of having a great, like, Casino Royale was a great script, a great story. It's a remake as well, wasn't it? Uh, so maybe, maybe, maybe Timothy didn't benefit from that. Like you say, if you write your film around more and you picture more in your head and you bring somebody in who has the, dis the disadvantage of just simply not being Roger Moore, maybe that was uh, affected him somewhat. Like I said, he didn't have the right aura for how the film. I I think what might have helped Daniel Craig too is um, something we touched on earlier was the Bourne franchise. That like nowadays he's not being compared to Pierce Brosnan; he's being compared to Jason Bourne, Matt Damon's portrayal of the character. Yeah. So in our eyes, we look at Daniel Craig. We don't say um, his portrayal of Bond is different than Pierce Brosnan's. We're looking it's like is his portrayal of Bond as realistic or is it as resonant with Matt Damon's portrayal of Jason Bourne? I think that's the way a lot of new generation look at it. So I don't think he's even compared to past Bonds in a lot of people's eyes. In my opinion, I think he's compared to his contemporary spies like a Tom Cruise as Ethan Hunt in the Mission Impossible series or Matt Damon as Jason Bourne in the Bourne franchise. Um, what do you think, Steve? I think that um, we embrace what we know now. I don't think people are thinking about Roger Moore. I think that oldies like me think about sean connery because i grew up with sean connery i'm not comparing daniel craig i think that uh i think as you mentioned you have these other characters in the marketplace that bond has to compete with now to be ahead of the game yeah it's very, by the way i don't i don't envy the task that the producers have to create a new bond movie every time because there's not a lot of uh you know, the, the, the stories, uh, you, you got to make them as unique as possible. And it's hard to come up with new stories. And it's also hard to come up with thrilling set pieces that get the audience excited. I mean, when I saw Spectre, you know, five years ago, six years ago, I thought their car chase was really anemic. You know, the one in Rome with Hinks and Bond after the Spectre meeting. I had just got, I just seen the Fast and the Furious, the latest Fast and the Furious movie with all those what they do with cars in the Fast and the Furious is kind of like the gold standard now yeah, for car yeah. chases. So, you know, it did. It, I, I, I'm comparing Bond to the other movies in the franchise. Uh, what I liked about the current Bond movie, No Time to Die, and I'm not going to give away any spoilers, it's gritty. The action sequences are very tough, and they compare well with what we're seeing in those other franchises. You know, the other series that is is kind of a bit of a goof, but also tends to push Bond in terms of competition are the Kingsman movies with Colin <laughs> Firth. Yeah. I mean, if you think about that, those are Bond movies with a very light touch. They're, they're, they're kind of a throwback to the Roger Moore type movies with yeah. the big outlandish villains. But they also do things that are challenging uh, Bond for the crown.
May I? Actually, I would be remiss now because of something I wanted to touch on and we touched when you said Fast and Furious. I, product placement has always been a massive thing in films and will continue to be. Even when you don't know it, they put down their bottle, of their, their, their can of Coke and the Coca-Cola will be facing the screen, all <laughs> yeah. that sort of thing. I remember iRobot being the, the film I always hold highest in guilt. But c- getting a car into a Bond film must have been... The, the absolute quintessential Incredible thing to do. Like forget forget having like a, a hundred million dollar ad campaign for the new Lamborghini. Mm. Get it in a Bond film. Get it inside a Bond film. And what Bond film, one of the, the two associations I make outside of James Bond himself is always the woman. There's always a Bond girl. Yeah. But and there's always a car. And Aston uh, Martin usually. And Aston something. Martin. Uh you know like the DeLorean was an absolute train wreck of a car and they, they did not sell at all but then it was in Back to the Future yeah. and people wanted DeLoreans but James Bond is the gold standard for me even with Fast and Furious out there what do you think was there a lot of politics in trying to get the Aston Martin in ahead of a Lamborghini and head of a Rolls Royce or was it always just predetermined that they just did what they wanted well we got we have to go all the way back to Goldfinger uh, you know, Ken Adam, uh, the production designer, and John Steers, the special effects guy, were given the task of finding a car. And I think they 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 looked around and it, there was a little bit of a, a lead with Ian Fleming's original novel of Goldfinger because Bond drives a DB3 in the original novel. So they decided to go for Aston Martin. But from what I gather, Aston Martin didn't give them cars. They uh, they had to go to Aston Martin and buy the cars from the plant. Wow! So and this is '64. Now, remember in in the world of Bond, uh, the first two James Bond movies had done very well, but the the, the I, th- I think the knowledge of the Bond series was wasn't nearly what it would suddenly be with Goldfinger. After Goldfinger, everybody opened up their doors to James Bond because they saw that everybody wanted to see Bond movies. But pre Goldfinger, I still think that uh, people weren't convinced that this was going to be a big hit series, even though the movies had done well. But as time went on, I'd say when people rem- say like people are talking about the Aston Martin, and you said '64, like people are talking about it all of these years later. That surely when it came into the last twenty years or something like that, it was it, it must have been some point. I'd say I would say that they paid below the odds for cars at the very least. Uh, because it's such a huge part of the franchise, especially oh, Pierce sure. Brosnan's. Was it a BMW? And he was he was in the back of the car driving it with his phone, and it, it had all these gadgets yeah, BMW inside bike it. and everything. Yeah, um, and then, oh sure. And then, so I'm sure, talking no. about a major scene and a major motion picture, and I'm using the words BMW. Well, I and, think I think you could say that Bond invented product placement. Nobody oh, did yeah. product placement like that. I think that uh, it's a big political game to get your stuff into a bond movie you're absolutely right i think that um you know they've had interesting uh sponsors of their uh, ford was very involved in thunderball because you know ford uh uh their number of fords in thunderball and then in um uh the man with the golden gun the second roger one Moore, of my personal they, favorites yeah they made a deal with amc motors american motor corporation and they that's the car that does the 360 degree flip from the bridge uh, that the carl's bridge is that that one yeah so you're absolutely right i think that there's a lot involved in product placement you're going to see some interesting cars in this movie as well uh it's uh it's this is pure bond if you're thinking of going to the movies these days for uh, an adventure and and i think a fun adventure I don't think you can beat this Bond movie. Wow. So you were saying like, this Bond movie ranks amongst the absolute greatest. What Bond movie was this? It like I, How many Bond movies have we got as of the film you went to last night? Well, technically, there have been 25 official ones, including this one. There are two orphan Bonds. One is the remake <laughs> of The Ball, where Sean Connery came back, uh, Never Say Never Again, released the same year as Octopussy in 83. And then uh, the earlier Casino Royale was done as a total spoof in 67 with Woody Allen, Peter Sellers, and David Niven. Uh, when you have so, the words Peter Sellers, <laughs> you always think, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a bit of a spoof. I mean, he's it is the, definitely he's the gold a standard. And there's a funny story behind that because... Um, the Casino Royale book, which was Ian Fleming's first James Bond novel, was first acquired in the 50s 
by an actor producer named Gregory Ratoff. And Gregory Ratoff, I guess, was under contract at 20th Century Fox. And he, <coughs> he brought it to the studio. And, and I've just been reporting on this. He actually thought of it as a vehicle for a woman. Yes. Uh, they, brought it, they brought it to Susan Hayward, uh, the red-haired actress under contract at that time. And for a brief time, there was a thought that James Bond would be a woman, which is, of course, ridiculous as we think about it. Because uh, I don't know how, how that would have been taken in 1950s. So that fell apart. And Greg, Gregory later sold the rights to Charles K. Feldman, who was a top agent in Hollywood at that time. But by the time Feldman got the rights, Sean Connery had already started to make Bond movies. So he realized he couldn't get Sean to be in Casino Royale. So he decided to do a big spoof and you would have multiple James Bonds, et cetera, et cetera. It's a big overblown movie. I don't highly recommend Casino I've Royale. I've never seen it. You wouldn't recommend it. It, it should be on my most watch list. It's, there's five directors. There's probably seven writers credited. It's a big, goofy spoof. And although it's not totally forgettable, I mean, any movie that you have Woody Allen and Peter Sellers and Orson Welles and... and At the David height of their powers. Yeah, it's, it isn't totally forgettable, but it's a it's not exactly successful either. <laughs> What about Bond women? Uh, what, what, what do you think of the... Well, first of, all, first of all, what do you think of the shifting roles of Bond women that were gone from being quite hapless, falling in love with him, uh, having to be saved a bunch of times, to actually being kind of perhaps more strong uh, sidekick characters in a way? Do you think, oh, yeah. What do you, the, the progression and, how, and who... And I suppose I'd like to, 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 to finish it off. I'd like to know who your favourite Bond girl actually was. Oh, of course, of course. Well, uh, you're absolutely right. The Bond girls have reflected the times. I think the probably, probably the most, um, the most, uh, the most. Uh, the, uh, excuse me. Let me get my facts straight here. Uh, my first real sense that the Bond women were really changing was the spy who loved me when Barbara Bach comes on as the Russian major alongside Roger Moore, and they're both sent to Egypt to find this missing tracking device. Barbara Bach matches him move for move. And I yes. thought that was very much the future of Bond. She was trained and she was she knew how to handle a weapon. She knew how to, she knew what the mission was. She wasn't caught up in the whirlwind of James Bond. She was her own discernible, definable character. Exactly. And and not all the Bond women that followed were what what I would say empowered. But um I think like Michelle Yao, who was opposite Pearson to Tomorrow Never Dies, also another Great agent, movie. this Chinese agent, yeah, brought brought along to help him. Um, uh, Halle Berry in Die Another Day, uh, mm. Pierce's last movie, again, brought on as an agent. And in this latest movie, No Time to Die, you've got two very, very empowered women. Uh, Lashana Lynch, who we mentioned, plays the new 007. And uh, Anna de Armas plays uh, a CIA agent as well. And they're both very empowered. I think that there's always going to be times when you're going to have Bond women that Bond needs to save. They're not exactly firing guns next to him. Uh, the Leah Sedu character who stars in this movie and who also was the star of Casino Royale is not exactly an agent who accompanies Bond. And she's not what you called, a, you know, an empowered female, but she's, she's a damsel, is she? She's a bit of a damsel, exactly, a, the damsel yeah. in distress. Uh, but I think cinema has changed so much in the last 20 years, and particularly in empowering women to be their own people. So I don't think we have the kind of breathless female we had back in the day. I and think, Grant, yeah. Sorry. sorry, no, I was just going to say, I think um, when you look at these kind of movies, you kind of need for a damsel or just someone you need a person you need someone physical for bond to save because when you tell a massive story in terms of scope and scale you need something personal like so when you have like um skyfall he's trying to save m throughout the entire movie mm. he's trying to save the world true and trying to save all these agents true and all this great grand scheme thing but he's trying to save m really when it comes down to it. so he needs someone close to him like a person or a damsel or a person like just a guy or anyone someone that has a personal connection with James Bond in a, each and every movie for it to be someone tangible for him to save. 
Because when you're saving the world is one thing, but you need to be saving someone that has a face for the audience to resonate with, you know? So I think that's why you have your damsel characters or just anyone that's in peril because James Bond just needs someone to save, to give the, I don't know, the good side uh, a face, you yeah, know? It needs to have a face for the character. Yeah, exactly. If I may, if I may jump on the words, it's too point, big, you know? Is I, I was, I mean, we've met a point between ourselves where sometimes you watch a film like Armageddon mm-hmm. and a meteor comes in, tears through a building, wipes out like parts of Paris and stuff. And that's just a scene. You did, uh, Marvel, uh, the Avengers had New York and torn apart. But that's just a scene. But you need a car- one character that you care about yeah. in a film is kind of worth millions that are just like a statistic, a scene. Everything blows up and that's that. that in now, are we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was probably a bad move. <laughs> probably a bad move. <laughs> what's, what's the trend in box, Alan? <laughs> yeah. uh, but I was just saying that, yeah. There was a, the, the, but yeah, to dude. answer your question of who's my favorite Bond girl, Please. I have to go back to Thunderball, which is the fourth James Bond movie. Uh, Claudine Auger, who was Miss France at that time, uh, I found her to be a stunning presence in that Bond movie. Uh, sexy as hell, uh, great wardrobe, uh, definitely the is kind she, of Is she woman. the beach, the, the bikini on the beach? Is that oh, her? No, the bikini on the beach is the first James Bond movie. That's Ursula Andress coming out of the water in Dr. No. Okay, but, sorry. Uh, uh, Claudine plays Domino. She's the mistress of the head of Spectre in the island uh, in the Bahamas. And uh, she's the one that Bond meets in the water while he's uh, diving into the water. Uh, and she's the br- uh, sister of the NATO agent that has been turned by the, um, or that has been blackmailed uh, by Spectre. Okay, then let's talk about, because we've covered a lot of the kind of bases of Bond. How have we not talked about villains? Because if there's one thing that I think Bond has, <laughs> even over Marvel, you have your DC, you have your Joker, yeah. and you have your Thanos, I don't care. For me, the absolute penultimate villains, the men who are going to take over the world with like a cat and a bald head and a scar down your eye or whatever it may be, I thought Bond, for me, is the film I go back to in my childhood that introduced me to... Not just like a gang trying to rob a bank, but villains. These huge characters with these huge intentions or these huge visions. World domination. World, world domination, etc. Um, you know, global destabilization. Yeah, the, the pinnacle of villains at its time. Could well, you I talk think... a little bit about villains in the book? Oh, sure, sure. Well, you have to go back to the original Ian Fleming source material. Ian Fleming had a great imagination. You know, he had been a spy master during World War II. He had been with naval intelligence. So he was sending teams of spies into Nazi-occupied Europe to deal with things. So he, he knew about spycraft. And I think he just let his imagination go crazy back in the 50s. And, uh, for instance, with Dr. No, uh, the first James Bond uh, movie, although it wasn't the first James Bond villain, um, he just uh, kind of drew on some of the Fu Manchu stories of the wicked Asian villain and that of course became our dr no and i my favorite bond villain is goldfinger of course that was the first bond movie i saw because he was a larger than life character with an with a terrific scheme i mean detonating an a-bomb in fort knox to destroy all the american gold and making his gold more valuable was a brilliant scheme and that by the way that was not what happened in the book in the book the the robbers actually plan to rob fort knox and take all the gold out by truck, which, of course, as Bond points out in the movie, would have taken forever. Yeah. Uh, Richard Maybaum, who's the unsung hero of those early James Bond movies, he was the writer. He's the one who came up with the idea of irradiating the gold in Fort Knox. But you're right. the villain. I, I could arguably say that the best Bond movies are the ones with the best villains. <laughs> When you, the, I want to talk about. I'm going to ask you. Sorry, Benny. No, no, I, was good, that's me I want to ask you a, bit, a question about you. So you're, you're 50. How many years ago did you go see Goldfinger? 57 years ago. Okay, so you were one years old, and you went to see Goldfinger. <laughs> <laughs> and is that the reason that today I am speaking to you as one of the world's leading authorities on James Bond? Is did something magical happen to this young man? Did, this, did you say that this is going to be a part of, of what I do going forward? Well, I, I, I go back a little bit further that, that year. Um, my father would go on business trips and he would bring home Western paperbacks. 
And I had no interest in reading Western paperbacks. You know, I've been watching all the Westerns on television, so I didn't need to read about Westerns. And then one day he dropped a paperback on my desk and it had a naked woman on the cover covered in gold. Nice. And uh, I, said, <laughs> I, was tw- I was 12 and my, I said to my dad, what is that? <laughs> and I opened, I cracked open Goldfinger and started to read. And I was learning things about women I'd never, I was 12. I, that, in those days I was reading books and that we Americans considered the archetype books of the day, the Hardy Boys, Tom Swift, you know, all those kids' books, the Happy Hollisters. The adventurous and, books, right? Yeah, and comic books. I mean, to give me Goldfinger was kind of, whoa. But at that time, every one of my classmates in, in middle school had those little paperbacks. And uh, they loved the paperbacks. And uh, I I just, it was a good time for me to write, uh, to to see Bond that Christmas for Goldfinger. And then when I started being a writer back in the 70s, I wrote for a magazine in Chicago called Cine Fantastique. I think you guys got it out over over there in in the island. Um, um, I I was starting to to get a reputation for writing retrospective articles about classic movies, particularly science fiction films. And then I did my first book was called Combat Films, American Realism, 1945 to 1970. And that was not a rousing success for a book. So I think I sold 400 copies. So I was looking around for a subject to write about that had a little bit more of an opportunity to make some money because I needed to make a living or at least make some value. And I discovered that the Bond movies, that they'd never written a Bond movie book about the behind the scenes about Bond. Um, John Brosnan had done a book called James Bond in the Cin- Cinema, but that was a tribute book, just telling you the stories and not much behind the scenes information. So I went to Cubby Broccoli, the you know, co-producer of the series, and I got cooperation and I came over to England in 1977 to do my interviews and research. And I got complete cooperation from the, the producers. Oh wow! And is the rest? Is it just did it snowball from there? Because once you get once you get an opportunity like that, it leads to other opportunities. I'd imagine. Well, it would have. It have my relationship hadn't soured. Unfortunately, they they didn't like the direction my book was going. So it it, it turned out they withdrew cooperation about six months later. But uh, I still was able to get the book out. And then in 1990, I was approached by another publisher to do a formal encyclopedia. And I've now done four of them. You know, this this latest one, the James Bond movie encyclopedia, is the fourth edition and includes No Time to Die. And as you can see, this is the cover. You got Sean and uh, Pierce, excuse me, and George. And then if I scroll down, you'd see uh, Daniel uh, Craig as well. You uh, so you so what years? This is your fourth. Uh, so what years were they released? Uh, 1990, 1995, 2003, and 2020. Wow. Is it, is I, it, I had not covered the Bond movies uh, uh, since 2003. So the, not only did I bring the book up to date, but I also have color photography in my book for the first time. I, I went to Europe uh, last year, actually 19, and I acquired photographs from all different sources. Sources, So I have over 400 photographs in the new book and a lot of illustration done by a wonderful um, American illustrator named Jeff Marshall. And he gave me 20 of his paintings to feature. And he does the most evocative paintings, his versions of each of the movies. So the book is packed with stuff. Wow, it sounds like it's it, it sounds like, but also uh, what I love about this uh, a product like this, it comes from somebody with love. It wasn't somebody trying to put something out into the world to make a quick book. This has been something that has been with you that you've carried for all of a torch for for all of these years. Oh yes, and, and that's yes. just really remarkable to me because you know I my attention span is not what I am known for. <laughs> but to be so dedicated to something for so many years, it, it, it must have really just really done something magnificent to you. I think you're a great ambassador for something like the James Bond series. Well, thank you. Uh, when you bump into Michael Wilson and Barbara Broccoli next time, just say some nice words about me. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, we, 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 don't, we don't, it's not the, 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 um, the tension is long gone. I haven't spoken to them in 40 years. So basically I do my thing. I'm probably one of their biggest supporters in terms of the series. 
Uh, I, I I absolutely love the I love the Bond series, ups and downs. It's kind of the thing I've always loved. I I, I love other films and other shows, um, but Bond has always had a special place in my heart, and I've been happy to carve out a niche to be uh, an historian of it. Have you ever got to sit down with any of the gentlemen who have who have um, who have actually held the mantle, a Connery, a Lazenby, or any of these men? Lazenby. You sat down with Lazenby. I sat down with Lazenby. He was the guest of honor 40 years ago at what we called the James Bond weekend in Los Angeles. We took over the Playboy Club mm-hmm. and we had a reunion of a lot of Bond veterans. And Playboy's had- not sexy enough. Get me James Bond. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that was fun. God, it was 40 years ago. Um, but uh, Connery, Connery was just didn't want to talk about Bond anymore by the time I first started writing my books. And I got some quotes answered by Roger Moore. I, I mean, I got some, some quotes from him. Um, I haven't talked to Daniel. There's so much information available on the internet, countless numbers of interviews. So it's not like I need to ask Daniel yes. Craig, you know, uh, how did you oh, get this is a, This is re- research, research, and then more research, as well as the right. passion, as well as everything. Right. Exactly. Isn't, it, isn't it true they asked Sean Connery to come back to play the Albert Finney role in Skyfall? Why he refused? I think Sean was retired by then, pretty much. I yeah. think... Because uh, they uh, wanted it, a Skyfall to be like a retirement home for Bonds, for old Bonds. <laughs> and like, it was, he was supposed to come back and Connery was supposed to be there in the Albert Finney role. I think it would have been wonderful. We would have just let it's like the Aston Martin coming back. You know, whenever you see it, it's like a throwback to the history of Bond. For many years, they didn't really do a lot of that. They didn't realize the importance of bringing up some of their history. But they started to bring it back. I mean, there's that great moment at the beginning of Four Your Eyes Only where Roger goes to the grave of Tracy, you know, his wife from Honor Majesty's Secret Service. And that those I like I've always liked those moments. The, the people who are about to see No Time to Die, there are there are some of those moments in the new Bond movie. So I think they'll appreciate that. A uh, movie that's aware of its past. It's uh, probably hard to squeeze it all in when the past goes back all the way to 1964. Ian Fleming was past at this stage. Ian Fleming's a bit of a talkie, and he never. Did he, am I right in saying that? What year did he pass? The year that Goldfinger was released. It was. Did he ever get to see Goldfinger? I don't know. I think he was on, he's photographed being on the set, but whether he was able to see it, I'm not sure. Probably because he died in August of that year. And I think the movie was finished by then. He probably did see it. That's for you. Uh, he always remarked to Richard Maybaum, the writer, he always said that my, your movies are funnier than mine. And I think that what Maybaum did is introduce some, what they call throwaway humor. You know, throwaway humor is different than just jokes. You know, throwaway humor is epitomized by Sean Connery as Bond seeing the hearse go over the cliff and Dr. No, and a construction worker comes running up and says, what happened? And Bond says, I think they're on their way to a funeral. (laughs) (laughs) Pierce Brosnan was the best for the one-liners, though, wasn't he? Like, like I, I watched them all, like every movie he has four or five cheesy one-liners. Like, yeah, <laughs> I think uh, Roger Moore for me. I think it's, I, I, I loved Roger Moore. And, uh, you could, uh, Roger Moore was the one for me that was always bugging Q. Hmm? Like Q just wanted a sense of just of a professionalism for him. And he was always, he was just always busting his balls. I think you might call it now, <laughs> maybe not back then. Or making love to a beautiful woman. He dabbled in that too. Hey, Roger Moore. Yeah. yeah. Um, is there anything? Is there anything you would like to say about your book? That 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 is it a continuation of? It does it cover all of the bonds? Or, or if I was to get your encyclopedias, would you, would, it, would I find that it's uh, each generational? Book is, each book is well. Each this book. this movie, uh, excuse me, this book. Uh, I, I decided since it had been uh, fifteen years since I'd done a bond book, I had to completely rewrite it. You know, there's. Uh, there are a lot of the same references from the earlier encyclopedias. I mean, obviously, I still cover all the films, but I, I added a lot more information about the backgrounds of the players so you can know what other things they've done and where they previously worked with other Bond players on. I completely re-illustrated the book. Almost every picture is a new picture. So if you have the previous encyclopedia, this is a nice addition because it's, uh, it's more of a compact book. 
and it's uh, this. This is the cover. I mean, this is. It, it's, I love it, the 007. Gold yeah, it's not nice. I yeah, love it's, that. Yeah, it's a nice touch, and the company Chicago Review Press has done a nice job with it. So uh, it's also a little more compact. It doesn't take up as much room on your shelf, uh, even though it's still 400 pages. It's a smaller version. It's not it's so much a coffee table book, but it's still a fun book. I, I'm actually definitely, definitely going to get it, and you are going to sign it. I don't know exactly what the, the, the pragmatism <laughs> of that actually is, but it's definitely happening. <laughs> I have his address now anyway. I got you, Steve Rubin. Yeah, we got you, Stephen <laughs> J. Rubin. You uh, get me your address and I'll send you both books. Oh, oh. awesome. Thank you. Oh, I love <laughs> that. I love <laughs> podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> you got it displayed on your coffee table, though, so I can sell some more. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> put, it on the back, put it in the background. Yeah, we'll put it in the background. That's a fair. There you That's go. That's a deal. Um, Steve, uh, Steve something we touched on earlier is like uh, you mentioned, you said some of the best Bond movies, in your opinion, were the ones that had the best villains. And um, we do a podcast that covers superhero movies and stuff at uh, Dark Side of the Moon. And when we talk on that, uh, a lot of the, the best superhero movies are the ones with the best villains. And we often talk about how, like, pick me a weak superhero movie with a, a strong villain and vice versa, pick me a strong superhero movie with a weak villain. And it's very rarely that you have that, uh, they never really link up. And I was going to say to you was, over the, what, 25 or so movies of Bond, and we've seen many famous actors portray the villains. Which do you think was the best villain? And which do you think like was the best villain from, just say, the golden era of Bond before Brosnan and since the more modernistic interpretation of Bond? Very good question. Uh, the Connery Bonds, as I mentioned, I think Goldfinger was my personal favorite. Uh, the, um, the Roger Moore Bonds, I would have to say, I, I thought that uh, the villains were okay. I mean, I, I, none of them stand out terribly much. Uh, the... Since Octopussy is my favorite Bond movie uh, that Roger was in, I would have to say that uh, the general played by Stefan Burkhoff was really good in that movie. He's the one who wants to de detonate that A-bomb on a U.S. Air Force base. And he, he, there were two villains in that movie. You had uh, Louis Jordan played Kamal Khan, the Afghan prince. So he's the one who's allied to the Russian general. So I like that. In the Pierce Brosnan movies... Um, I would have to say that in the uh, the world is not enough, which uh, takes place dealing with that pipeline. Uh, the actor, and I'm gonna I'm gonna forget Robert Carlyle. Thank you, thank you, Robert Carlyle as the one who has the bullet in his brain. I thought he was no, amazing. Yeah, no, he's, no. he's like slowly dying, and so like he's got nothing to lose. I love that, but until they figure out the one thing he has to lose is his. The love of you know the the, the femme fatale of the movie. Um, I can't remember right. the actress better. Like, and that's how they kind of they, they figure out how to weaken him. He was a terrific actor in it. Yeah, he is it so Sophie I, Marceau? Sophie Marceau. Sophie Marceau, exactly. Yeah. And then in the the Daniel Craig's, I have to say that uh, Mads Mikkelsen's Le Chief in Casino Royale, yeah, yeah amazing, terrific. And then you you can't not mention uh, Javier Bardem Silva in Skyfall. <laughs> I mean, with scene. that horrifying mouth. Oh, God. That yeah. scene's incredible where he's explaining what cyanide does to you when you don't die. And he's talking oh, about yeah. his time in, in, in imprisonment. I love that scene. He's such a captivating actor. Yes. Uh, yeah, you know, Bardem. The best villains show their humanity. And I think Bardem perfectly showed that, as did Robert Carlyle. You know, you forget for a moment that these guys are super villains, but they have their own problems. And uh, I, I like that. Um, They're the hero of their own story. That's complicated storytelling, which is what storytelling should be. Not everyone yeah. should be able to do it at exactly. that level. And yeah. he's an ex, Xavier Bardem is an excellent, excellent. Um, and in terms of Blofeld, who's the only continuing villain in the series, we've seen him several times. I would say Telly Savalas' Blofeld in Honor Majesty's Secret Service was the most fun. You know, he was the most physical um i kojak I, kojak exactly <laughs> <laughs> that's how i grew up doing telly swallows from his kojak my mother used to watch it the whole time and he used to oh, like me sure. uh, the lollipop the lollipop <laughs> who, yeah. lo who loves you baby yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i love that show <laughs> um so like steve when you look uh so when you're looking ahead like for the uh, the bond franchise like, how do you think it's going to play out? Do you think the next 007, I know, like, you have more information than we have because we haven't seen No Time to Die yet. 
But uh, Lashawn Lynch, as you um, kind of touched on earlier, takes over the mantle of 007. And without giving too many spiders away about the next installment, for those who haven't seen it, how do you think the future of the Bond franchise is going to play out? Do you think we're going to see um, maybe an Idris Elba come in, take over the mantle of James Bond? Do you think we're going to see a Henry Cavill? Do you think maybe Lashawn Lynch will continue on the 007 uh, moniker and James Bond will just be James Bond, but he won't be 007 anymore? How do you think the future is going to play out over the next maybe four or five films? Because usually, I think Daniel Craig's the first person to play James Bond five times. I may be mistaken, but it's usually four times, isn't it, that they played him? Well, no, no. Actually, uh, Connor, Connery and Moore both played him seven times. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, geez, I was way off. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I think that uh, you mentioned Henry Cavill. He's kind of what I consider to be a safe choice. Yeah. I mean, he obviously has the the requisite panache and good looks and physicality. I mean, he's having a moment right now. Henry Cavill is just having a moment for the past decade or so. Yeah, it's yeah, a very big moment, worried. dude. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's uh, he's he's popular. Um, I hope I hope they get a Daniel Craig type actor, somebody who's not well known. When Daniel got the role in 2006, we didn't know who he was. A blonde Bond? Come on. You know, but <laughs> Is we, he the uh, first blonde Bond? Yeah. Yeah, he yeah, was blonde, the first yeah. blonde Bond. And uh, it was... Uh, James Blonde. James Blonde. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think I'd like to see a young actor in his 30s. You know, uh, 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 Daniel was 38 when he got the role. So it could be somebody who's just a little bit under the radar now, maybe. It's uh, funny. He's supposed to be playing a mysterious secret agent. You know, <laughs> getting a high, pro- high profile actor, you know, may not seem the right touch these days, especially since we're going for a more realistic bond. Uh, and do you think the next movies will be a continuation or will be a, a reboot again? Because in, in my my hypothesis or whatever, my theory about the bond is that Daniel Craig has a real name and it's not. James, James Bond, Bond yeah. like Sean Connery's character had a real name, and he's not James Bond. Like in my You'd probably mind, like be introducing yourself a bit too often as a secret agent if you were using your real name. You know what I mean? Like in my mind, it's like do you know what Jason Bourne is and his real name. I think it's Mark Webb or David Webb or something. Yeah. Like I think it's David Webb or something. So like I think like in my in my mind when I look at the Bond movies because certain actors carry over and certain ones don't, and I know it doesn't line up altogether with the continuity, but like I think the bond name if like is a moniker more than an actual person so like i think you could nearly continue on constantly but just say i'm the new james bond and you could carry over the same cast well i th- it's interesting i i think that they're going to reboot with another bond it just seems to be the way to go the daniel craig route in 2006 was a little risky, you know, to start over again. But look what's happened. You've gotten five films and they've been enormously successful. This series is bigger than one actor, you know, et cetera. It's, it's a, it's people want to see Bond movies for the thrill and for all the reasons we've discussed today. They want to see the women. They want to see the action. They want to see the villains. They the want to see the cars. Exactly. Yeah. So you, you, you find a good actor. Uh, which is, by the way, not easy because, you know, you sign on to do Bond, your life changes for the next, so, you know, in, in, in Craig's case, it's changed for 15 years. But um, I think that my sense is they're going to find another actor and he's going to carry the banner forever. I mean, I'm not forever, but until they until he wears out. I mean, the, uh, there's no reason for me to think that the Bond movies can't go on forever, because if you think about it, there are very few series that are this successful for this long. Is there any for this successful? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, and definitely no. No, it's definitely the I longest mean, only, series. Only Star series. Wars could you could say somewhat. Although I would say Star Wars has made money. Although creatively, I don't think it's been as good as it was originally. Yeah, yeah, Martin. It's and it's only had eleven switch. movies, like nine in the main timeline. Whereas Bond has had what court, like twenty-five movies, like. In the court of century movies. Yeah, you know what I mean? like, yeah. Although I have to, t- I have to tell you guys, I was asked a trivia question the other day about which series has had the most movies and are the longest run, and I obviously said Bond, and I was wrong. It's uh, Godzilla, thirty-four movies. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, the cheap ones back in the 50s. The yeah, of course, but they count. Yeah. But they count. <laughs> I love those movies. The old Godzilla versus King Kong, where you can see them in the suits. Yeah, you can see the outlines on a spot. I love the terrible movies. cities that they were fighting in. That yeah, were made of plywood. Yeah, or if they were even made of plywood. Yeah, I love those movies. <laughs> That's when Hart was really made. Like, like I think nearly the better special effects got nearly the storytelling got worse sometimes. Yeah, you know, because he became reliant on special effects to make up for the the weaknesses. The in Michael Bay effect. You know? The Michael Bay effect. Yeah, I said it. <laughs> Nobody you, else was going to, so I said it. If there was ever, I know it's kind of full path, but if there was ever an American or someone that was outside like Ireland, England, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland to play James Bond, who would your choice be? Uh, other than people from, I'm sorry, repeat the question, please. Sorry, um, outside of the, do you know, like uh, James Bond is only being portrayed by people from Ireland, England or like anywhere from Ireland or Great the Britain Commonwealth, yeah. and outside of Ireland or Great Britain who would you like to see or who would your choice to be you said Cavill and, where's Cavill from uh, Cavill's English is it your okay. well um, first of all he has to be a Commonwealth actor there's no way an American or anybody in another ethnicity well, is this is just a hypothetical if you had right. the choice you know uh, it's very good <laughs> it's a very <laughs> good question um, I well, I don't know if you guys know a TV series that's very pop was very popular over here that you uh, you you probably got originally uh, called Strike Force. Yeah. No, yeah, Strike. I don't yeah, it, Strike. It, it had a different protagonist every season, I think. Or not Strike Force, Strike yeah. Back. It was called Strike Back. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, the two guys who played the two leads in that series, I thought were terrific. One was an Australian, and one was an American. I don't know their na- names, but. They were very good, although I don't think they have the level of what they need for Bond. It's <coughs> tough. It's tough. I think Henry Cavill could be interesting, but I, like I said, I'd like a little lower profile of an sure. actor. In terms of guys that come off the, just come off to me right now, I can't think of anybody. That's why it's going to be a challenge for the producers to find another Bond. But he's out there. Believe me, he's out there. Yeah. Thankfully, that's not our headache. <laughs> <laughs> it's a headache, but it's not our. Do you headache. think it, it could be a case of Henry Cavill might be a little bit, for lack of a better term, debonair to be the new Bond on the back of Daniel Craig? Because Daniel Craig is so gritty, so rough, so real, on the back of Pierce Brosnan, who was a, a bit of a throwback to the gentleman spy era. And now it's going to be very hard for the next person who's going to fill Bond because uh, they're going to have to go even grittier, even more real. Or maybe we have the inverse and they'll go maybe a more debonair gentleman spy again. I don't think that. I don't think you can go debonair. Not in this arena. This is a very mm-hmm. troubled world we're living in. I don't think debonair works anymore. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I would you agree. Can't, you, can't, yeah. you can't beat off the villains with a funny line and a quip. <laughs> yeah. you got to be have your suits. Have your suits untainted by the whole process. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, Tom, Tom Hardy was considered. I, I is probably mm. in the running, but I, I don't know if Tom Hardy has the panache to do it. I mean, he, even though Bond has to be gritty, I think Daniel Craig. Had very charming, quality, very charming quality about him. Yeah. That I like a dry true. wit. Like he's very dry or something. But right. every, like every time, he obviously troubled as well. Yeah. which I thought was a great thing. You, you know, need to be able to be brooding. You know, James James Bond, so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that was one of uh, Craig's best uh, things. Like he was able to do the action and he was able to do the violent realism. But he was able to drop a dry line, a quip, a little bit of funniness here or there. So like when he did land the, the ten out of ten woman. That it seemed natural, like he didn't look like he wasn't just like this rough guy that didn't know how to handle himself in situations. He was a spy and a soldier. That's yeah. what I liked about him. He was a soldier when somebody was trying to stick his throat. Yeah, and he'd beat the shit out of that dude. Then he's the soldier, but he's a spy when he has to manipulate someone. He has to bend the situation to his will. Yeah. And that's what Danny Craig would take tactically. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he portrayed both uh, sides of Bond in this new era, I think, because you have to be a soldier and a spy. Because you have to be able to manipulate these situations, but also you have to be able to beat two guys in a fist fight when yeah, you know, yeah. you have like a pen for a weapon or something. You know what I mean? I think that was the best thing about Danny Craig. Because the Casino Royale was for opening, I think, just yeah. cemented him straight away as a new type of bond. Yeah. He wasn't yes, using yes. really, really advanced gadgets. He it, but he was so determined that and yeah. he just chased this guy down. I, I I just thought the first 15 minutes he's of relentless. that movie, I realized that this was a different Bond straight away. Yeah, he's and that's relentless. why I think oh, yes, the opening really scene of Royale was just so you fe- You felt his punches. You felt oh, that. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. when, he, when he, he, you know, uh, he's just, uh, he's just balls out, we say. He's just balls out. He just kind of kicks ass from the beginning. Mm. And do you, do you think, um, 
if they are rebooting the series that we will lose like actors like Lasana Lynch, uh, Ben Wimshaw, uh, Ray Fiennes. Do you think they'll carry over in the same way Judy Dench carried over from the Pierce Brosnan era for a movie and a half um, into the no two and a half movies? Sorry, somebody will. Um, I'm sure. Somebody in the same will. way, uh, like you know, like do you, so do you think we'll have a recasting of an M, a new Q, you know, a, a new right hand person like the way Lashana Lynch? Do you think she will carry forward? Do you think Ben, ben Wimshaw uh, will be the new? Like, do you think he'll stay going? And Ray Fiennes, or do you think we'd be recast all across the board? I think it's going to de- de- depend on their availabilities. Uh, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, Naomi Harris, who plays Money Penny, could be back. Uh, uh, I-, I think that they're all possibilities. It's hard to say. That's it. I think I think we're going to we're going to yeah. probably leave it there. I think it's yeah. been a fantastic. I think I know more about James Bond. <laughs> oh God, I'm going to be talking about James Bond for the next week. <laughs> So I Hi, it's been a real pleasure. You guys are really fun to talk to. And please get me your addresses so I can send you books. Oh, awesome. my God. It, it's, uh, Stephen, it has been absolutely spectacular talking to you about something I love so much. My father is going to be jealous. I have a lot of friends that are going to be jealous. And I haven't got much going on in my life, so I have this <laughs> Lord over them. So this is, this is good. You really have to be <laughs> so, Once again, where can where can people, the, the good folks at home, where can they get your with your excellent encyclopedia here? Okay, so uh, probably the best way to order it is from Amazon. It's called the James Bond Movie Encyclopedia, and uh, it's available in some stores, but probably Amazon for people overseas is probably the best source. And if Steve, is it Steve J. Rubin? Steve, Steve J. Rubin is the, the ultimate uh, name, because people are going to say Steve Rubin Stephen here in the J. corner. Rubin. It's actually Stephen J. Rubin with a Excellent. V. Yes, definitely. And if you want to reach out to me, I have a strong Facebook presence on on Saturdays. I publish a classic movie review. I call it Steve Rubin's Saturday Night at the Movies on Facebook. That's a Facebook page. We also have a Facebook page called the James Bond Movie Encyclopedia. And then I also have just plain old Steve Rubin as a, as a Facebook page. I'm also on LinkedIn and Instagram. Thanks very much. That's awesome, Steve. It has so, just been amazing spending this hour. Thanks, with guys. Awesome, Steve. So thanks for joining us. And um, I'm your host, Vincent Green. He's your host, Noel John, too. We've got Karen Mack in the back. And this was MDK presents Stephen J. Rubin, the author of the James Bond movie encyclopedia. Thanks, Stephen, volume so much. Four. Uh, author of uh, Volume 4. And that's uh, that's out now. And people, check it out. This guy knows his stuff. It's an amazing talk to you, Stephen. And it was amazing having you here. And thank you so much for your time and for coming on. And thank you for watching. See you next time, folks.